Hi, uh, I am uh, Dr. Andrew Davis. I am a vitro-retinal surgeon, uh, currently employed here in Salt Lake City at Salt Lake Retina, and uh, glad to be with you guys today. We're going to go through uh, the basics of doing an ophthalmic exam, focusing specifically on the posterior segment exam of the eye and the retina. I'm a retina specialist, so that's what I do is I look at retinas. And what I'm going to try to do during this process is to give you little keys on how to manipulate the slit lamp and the instrumentation that we use in ophthalmology to be able to, 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 to fine tune in to different parts of the retinal exam. And uh, by, by taking the time to learn how to use the instrumentation, the lenses, the indirect, the slit lamp, it'll help you as the, the eye specialist to be able to, to properly diagnose diseases. And more importantly, by doing things in a step-by-step -step process, you'll better be able uh, to uh, to follow patients and having seen them once, next time you see them again, you'll be able to, to, to monitor for progression. Um, hopefully positive changes, though, although you'll also be able to see negative changes. And so it's worth the time uh, to learn how to use the instruments properly. And so in our discussion today, that's what we're gonna do, is I'm gonna focus in on how to use the instruments and hopefully give you a few keys that you can, you can practice with in the, in the clinic and while you're in your training program. So let's go. We have our patient here. Anytime you see a patient, they, they're, at least in my world, they're gonna be dilated. And so some of the parts of the end, the vision, the pressure, the, the pupils will already have been done. So I'm gonna skip past those. I think one of the con important concepts of doing an eye exam is to do it the same way every single time. So most things in ophthalmology, when we do the exam, uh, we go from left to right. So every part of the exam from outside the eye to all the way to the back, you're usually gonna start on the left side, go to the right side. And I think that's important so that you form a repetitive pattern that you follow every single time. And, and by doing so and doing the, same, the exam the same way every time, you're less likely to miss things. And the concept is, is to try not to miss things because we want to diagnose things and then help people. So um, vision, pressure, uh, pupils, everything has already been done. My patients are usually dilated. And so we'll start into the slit lamp exam. So first thing you're going to do is you want to make sure your patient is somewhat relaxed. Patients will be very anxious. You want to let them know that you care about them. And, uh, and so uh, I always kind of tell patients that we're going to be in a slit lamp exam. And I, I try to make sure they're comfortable. My patient population is, is generally a little bit more elderly. And so you want to make sure that their back, their neck, and things aren't contorted. If they're comfortable in the slit lamp, you're going to be comfortable and be able to find, to be able to spend more time trying to find the diseases. So first thing you'll do is bring the slit lamp over towards the patient. You'll kind of look where they are. The chin rest, I always eyeball where their chin is, and I'll bring it down to their level. However, you'll see a black mark here on the slit lamp. That needs to be level with the lateral canthus or the, the lateral part of where the two, two eye, eyelids come together. And so you're going to be lining that up so that their, uh, it'll be their right eye is lined up with this black mark. And so that's one of the first key parts of getting a patient into the set lamp. So you ask them to please come forward here, chin down in here, forehead up against the headrest. It's important they try to keep their head up against the headrest. You don't have to hound it too much. It's not the end of the world. Um, and then I'm looking, you can't see it right now, but I'm currently looking at the, that black mark on the right side. I'm looking uh, at the patient's lateral canthus, and I'm going to make sure it's lined up. And it's nicely lined up right there. So next thing I'll do is there are different settings on the power of the beam itself. Um, I usually set it on the half. There's a half and a one. You don't need to blast them with light. But at the same time, you brought them here to do an eye exam, so you might as well make sure you have enough light to be able to see. Sometimes patients will be light sensitive. Their pupils are dilated. They may have inflammation or redness, uh, or for whatever reason, they may be light sensitive. But I do think it's important to make sure you use enough light so you can see, and then just be patient with the, with the patient uh, to make sure that uh, it, you don't blast them with light too bad. So as a general rule, you're going to start with the right eye first, and then do the left eye. And you look at the, the, the eyelids, and, and then you look at the conjunctiva, and then the cornea, and then the anterior chamber, and then the iris, and then the lens, and then you go back to the fun part of the exam, the retina exam. So um, make sure you concentrate on those first initial things. But as a retina specialist, um, I look at those areas to make sure they look okay, and then I'm really thinking about getting back to where the fun starts, which is behind the iris. All right, so first things first, you'll notice on the slit lamp, 
There's a joystick down below that can make bring things into focus by moving it forward and back. And also, you can move it left to right. And then you can spin it. And spinning it raises it up and down so you can get the eye and, and level. Also on the slit lamp, these are the main two knobs you're going to use. This upper knob that controls the, the lateral movement of the beam, the side-to-side -side movement of the beam. It also increases the width. And so by spinning the knob, and you can actually go all the way in and all the way out and spin it all the way around, um, you, you widen the beam. And so at different parts of the exam, you're going to widen or narrow the beam depending on what you're looking at. Um, also, at the top here, uh, it gives a size of the beam. So this increases the width, this increases the height. The knob that's up here at the top increases the height of the beam. On the slit lamp itself, it actually gives a millimeter measurement. So let's say that you're measuring the size of a corneal abrasion, or more importantly for me as a retina specialist, if you're looking at the size of a, of a hyphema, uh, which is blood buildup in the anterior chamber, you can actually measure the size of that hyphema or how tall it is and then record that down so that later on you can record that, oh, it was five millimeter hyphema this week and then a week later it went down to three millimeters. So obviously having less hyphema is better than more hyphema, so you can track that. That's especially important with looking at corneal ulcers or corneal abrasions or things like that. But in retina, the retina world, uh, we, we use it especially to measure the size of hyphemas or blood in the anterior chamber. So. So I'm just going to start her exam on her right eye. I start out by looking at her eyelids, and then I look at the conjunctiva, and then the cornea. When you come to your cornea exam, that'll be a time where you start to narrow the beam. After the cornea, you're going to look at the anterior chamber. And in the retina world, we do a lot of uveitis or inflammation uh, inside of the eye exams. and so. Uh, to look in the anterior chamber, you're going to narrow the beam. You're going to make it uh, thin and narrow and focus in on the iris. And once you have the iris border or the pupillary border nice and focused, you can pull back a little bit. Also, you want to turn the beam up. And that will allow you, by focusing on the iris border, having a focus and then pulling back just a little bit or focusing out, that will allow you to see if there's any inflammation in the anterior chamber and this patient doesn't have any inflammation in her anterior chamber. So after looking at the cornea, then the anterior chamber, the iris itself, then you'll look at the lens and look for signs of cataractus changes uh, in the lens. And then after the lens, uh, we'll, you'll look back into where, like I say, where the fun starts in the posterior segment exam of the eye. One of the things with patients that I will always look at and I think is critical in doing a retina exam is to look at their vitreous. And you can see the vitreous and the fibers or the collagen fibers of the vitreous uh, right in the space behind the iris. It's a good place to see that. It'll allow you to look for blood there, inflammation, and also for age-related or sinuretic changes of the vitreous. And I'll look at that every single exam, no matter what I'm doing, and that can give me signs of or uh, an idea of there may be some sort of pathology back by the retina. One of the common exams that we do in the retina world is when a patient has a new onset of flashing light and floaters. And when, if they were to have a tear in the retina, uh, the tear, the retinal tear would release pigment cells or RPE cells into the vitreous. And that would uh, look like a tobacco dust um, or little teeny cells floating in the vitreous behind the lens, or a Schaefer sign it's called. And so um, how you look for a Schaefer sign is you focus in on the lens, narrow the beam, and make sure it's nice and bright. And then you tell the patient to look up, look down, and look straight ahead. And then as they're doing that, you move the joystick backward and forward until you can see the little collagen fibers. And intertwined or floating around those co collagen fibers could be those uh, pigment cells or the tobacco dust cells from a retinal tear or inflammation or blood or something like that. And so after seeing that, then you're gonna to go to the posterior segment exam of the eye. Commonly, there are two main types of lenses that you'll use. The purpose of lenses in doing a, a uh, retina exam is to be able to magnify uh, the images in the back of the eye. The common, common ones that are used are a 78 diopter lens and a 90 diopter lens. I'm using a 78 diopter lens. And there's some little tricks to be able to pick up 
the posterior segment of the eye or the retina using this lens. First and foremost, I like to do my posterior segment exam using the 78 Doppler lens, and I like to do it with my beam not shifted to one side or slanted to one side or the other, but straight on. I feel like that helps me to focus it. Also what I do is I make my beam a little bit taller and I make it a little bit narrower. narrower. And then once I have the nerve and the blood vessels and the macula in focus, then I'll change the size a little bit. I'll shorten the beam down and I'll widen it just a little bit. And that gives me a, a lit up area that's a little bit easier to see. And then that'll help me to focus in on the nerve and the blood vessels and, and that sort of thing. So again, when doing the fundus exam from the slit lamp, um, it's good to start out with a little bit narrower beam, a little bit taller beam until you get the nerve and the macula and the blood vessels in focus, and then shorten it and widen a little bit to start examining around. As a general rule, you're going to hold the lens with two fingers, your pointer finger and your thumb, and then you're going to use your pinky and a lot of times your ring finger either resting on the patient's forehead or on the forehead uh, rest itself, the plastic forehead rest. And then the trick of how to do this is you're going to put it up in front of their eye without touching it, but just in front of where their eyebrow is, and then you'll look in through the slit lamp, and once you find their pupil, you're going to pull back a little bit to see the orange beam come in focus, okay? When the patient is dilated, it's much easier to do. On a non-dilated patient, it takes a little bit more side to side and up and down movement to be able to get the, 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 the nerve and the retina and the macula into view and into focus. So. First things first, now that I've got the nerve and the macula in focus, I'm going to narrow the beam, shorten it, widen it just a hair. First thing you do when you look in the back of the eye is to look at the nerve of the eye. You'll look at the size, you'll look at the optic cup, and, and you'll look at the borders of the nerve, and you'll look at the blood vessels coming out of the nerve. In the retina world, we common see, commonly see patients that have diabetes and that have macular degeneration or uh, vein occlusions. There's inflammations, there's all sorts of other things, but each of these disorders uh, are commonly associated with something going on with blood vessels. And the blood vessels in the retina start, uh, most of them come from, uh, from, or start or originate from the optic nerve or travel through the optic nerve. And so you're going to make sure as you look at the nerve of the eye to look at what the blood vessels are doing there too. So we focused in on the nerve of the eye and after seeing the nerve and looking at the blood vessels, you are going to pull towards the patient's nose, all right? And that will shift the beam over towards the macula. The macula and the fovea are the high price real estate. That's where the majority of vision occurs and where the majority of uh, retinal diseases um, have their source and macular degeneration, diabetes. Um, when patients have issues with these disorders and many other disorders, uh, when they're swelling or bleeding in the macula, it will be the thing that affects their vision and why they came in to see you with vision complaints. And so again, the key is, and I guess a, a good point to bring up with that is that these lens reverse the images up and down and side to side. So the macula is always located temporal or lateral to the nerve of the eye anatomically. However, when you're doing your exam, to see it, you're gonna pull nasal or towards the nose to be able to get those into view. So after you see the nerve, you're gonna pull nasal and swing the, the slit lamp over towards the macula to get a good view. After looking at the macula, then generally I will swing and look at the blood vessels. I'll travel along the superior temporal arcade and the inferior temporal arcade and get a good look at the blood vessels. And then I'll look a little bit past that. In general, with the 78 Doppler lens and the 90 Doppler lens, you can see a, into the mid periphery, past the macula a little bit. From there, you're going to take over with your indirect ophthalmic exam. Um, and so those are the basics of the slit lamp exam looking at the posterior segment of the eye. And now we'll switch over and go to the indirect ophthalmoscopy. All right, so we have completed our slit lamp exam and our posterior segment exam using the 70 and the 90 Doppler lens. And now that we've looked at the posterior segment, the nerve, the blood vessels, the macula, the mid periphery, we're gonna to try to look out farther 
into the retina, so more out in the periphery of the retinal exam. And in order to be able to do this, uh, we commonly use uh, some different uh, tools. One is called the indirect ophthalmoscope. This is the indirect ophthalmoscope. And then we use two main lenses, a 20 diopter lens and a 28 diopter lens. And these lenses are such that allows for a less magnified but more wide field view of the back of the eye, thus being able to see out into the far periphery of the retina. And so first of all, again, key concept in learning this is to take the time to learn it and to get comfortable by making sure that the beams, the head positioning, the width of the, your, your two eyepieces are in the right location so that, that you're comfortable, you're going to better be able to, to assess and view the patient's posterior segment and out into the periphery of their eye. So I am going to go ahead and spin. So the cord's on my other side. And, and then in, in doing this, you're going to put it on. The upper knob will uh, shorten the height of this sitting on your head, and, and you want to make sure the eye paces are level with your eye. The back knob will tighten it. In general, you never have to really touch this one. It's usually set right, and you just untighten and untighten it to get it onto your head. So I just turned it counterclockwise, which loosens it, and then I'll turn it back clockwise to tighten it. Um, the two eye pieces are set correctly. They're about level with my eye, if you can see that. And, and then there's a knob here on the left that turns the beam on and off. Okay? You want to turn the beam on, bring the, eye, the piece here so it's just touching your nose. That generally ends up being about the right location. Not that it's smushing it, but it's just touching your nose. That way the, the, the kind of horizontal position is located correctly in relationship to your eyes. All right, and then as you look through, you're going to see a beam of light. And I'm going to turn that up to its highest because we're kind of lit up here in this room. In a dark room, it'll be a lot easier to see. The beam has different sizes. There's a wide beam, a medium beam, and a small narrow beam, so three different sizes. In general, you're not going to use the narrow one very often. If there's a very, very small pupil, you might use the narrow beam, but it gives a very small view into the retina. So I basically never use that little teeny beam. The medium one I use for a lot of my exams except for when I'm doing a scleral depressed exam. When I'm doing a scleral depressed exam, I'll use the wide beam here. Okay? Sometimes in starting out, obviously with more of a beam you get more light into the eye. Sometimes it makes the focusing in and out, the fill the view a little bit better. You may want to start out using the wide beam and then shift over to the medium beam as you do your exam. But again, I generally use the medium sized beam for most of my periphery exam, except when I'm doing a scleral depressed exam, and then I use the wide beam. And, but you'll just have to, to, to play with it and decide what, what each of you like to do best. So, first things first, as I look at my beam, and I'm looking through my oculars, the beam is a little bit down towards the bottom of my view. I want it right in the center. If you put it up here, you're not going to be able to tell. You've got to put the beam a little bit away. Sometimes I'll shine it on the patient and do it, or sometimes I'll hold out my hand, okay? And so I've got it there. There's a knob here on the left. That moves the beam up and down, okay? So just move it so it's right in the center of your oculars. Also, I open and close each of my eyes to make sure that the beam itself is located in the center for each eye. And it's actually going to be the center a little bit left for the right eye and the center a little bit right for the left eye. But it, this is a critical concept, a critical concept depending on um, the distance between your own two pupils. You want to make sure in each eye that you can see the entire beam. Okay, and that way when the two eyes work together, it'll give you the widest field of view or it may cut off part of your view on, on one particular side and that'll make it harder to focus in on that area. So again, make sure the beam, I literally every exam, I open and close each of my eyes and I make sure that that beam is nice and centered for each eye. It'll be shifted a little bit nasal for each and then as you open up both eyes, it should be right in the middle. I think that's a critical step. I literally do it thousands of exam, thousands of time doing that. I make sure that that's centered right because I know that'll help me to get my best possible view of the periphery of the patient's retina. Okay, so um, that's basically 
the, the nuts and bolts of getting the, the indirect ophthalmoscope ready. So next I'm going to go to my patient who's been patiently waiting for us. So again, key concept, start, do the exam the same way every single time. All right, I start with the right eye, I go to the left eye. What I'm going to do and what I do is I first of all, I, and, and there's different ways this can be done, but what I do is I start superior and I go lateral every single time. So I go temporal and I do that with both eyes. So on the right eye, I'm going counterclockwise and the left eye, I go cl clockwise. And by doing the same exam every single time, when I note changes, there's a change at nine o'clock or there's a change at two o'clock or four o'clock, by doing the exact same rotation every single time, hundreds of times over, I then don't have to think twice about where I saw a particular change. So when I write it down on my exam or I type it into my EMR or I put it onto my drawing, because I do my exam the same every time, it helps me to remember where I saw the changes. I personally think that's a critical step in doing the ophthalmic posterior segment far peripheral exam. Do the same thing every single time because let me tell you, when you have to start drawing stuff in and writing stuff down and if you see multiple changes in the eyes, it can become very complicated and you don't have to get up and do the exam over and over again. So the patient will stay nice and relaxed. It'll be like they're at the barber shop or the beauty salon because you're going to position their head around a little bit. And so I'll start with the right eye. I'll tilt their chin just a little bit to the left. All right. Key concept in holding this, it's like the 78 or the 90 diopter lens. You're going to use your thumb and your pointer finger to hold the lens. You use your pinky and your ring finger, okay, to rest on the patient's chin or their cheekbone. And then the key in getting the retina in view is you're going to put the lens in front of their eye. You'll be able to actually see in pretty good clarity their cornea and iris, and you'll see an orange red reflex. When you see that, also notice how my head is positioned, okay? Depending on where your head is, and you'll learn to adjust this back and forth in relationship to the lens, there'll be a distance that will be perfect for you depending on your size, your arm length, curvature of your hand. There'll be a, a certain distance between those two that is, that is perfect for you of where every single time you'll get that retina in focus. So I'm used to it. I know kind of where mine is. And so, again, you'll focus in, you'll see the cornea, the iris, and clarity, you'll see an orange reflex, orange red reflex. When you see that, with your thumb and your pointer finger, you're going to pull that lens out towards your eye here. Sometimes you have to move in a little bit, sometimes you don't. In general, it's a good habit to learn to where to keep your head distance the same and just learn to move this lens in and out. Once you have the 20 or the 28 doctor lens in the position where the view fills up the whole inside of the lens. So you'll see the whole retina inside of the lens, not part of it or not over here, but filling up the whole lens. That's the right location. And then you learn to look at all parts of the retina with the view itself being filled with the retinal exam. So first thing I do, again, pinky on the cheek. I already know where my head position is. I look at the cornea, the iris. I see my orange reflex of the posterior segment. I pull backwards until the retina is in view, then I tell the patient to look up. Same thing, I'm moving the lens forward and back. My head generally stays still because I know where that proper position is. I see the orange reflex, I pull backwards. One of the little subtleties of this, you'll learn to be fluid with your fingers because as you pull back, because it's a round surface, you're gonna have to turn it too a little bit, that's okay. So you'll pull and turn and you'll, you'll, you'll pick up the subtlety of that. So forward, I see the orange reflex, I pull back with my fingers, it's turning clockwise just a little bit, I look up at her superior retina, and then you look up and to the right, so this is her right, I always start superior and then work temporal, so up and to the right, and then look over to the right, alright, to see down and to the right really well, you can come from up here or even from the other side of the patient, alright, look down and to the right, so in, I see the orange reflex, I pull back, there's a nice view of her retina, look straight down, down and to the left. Sometimes, let me tell you another key thing, sometimes there may be a language barrier. We have a lot of patients that speak other languages here in the Salt Lake Valley. We also have uh, a very large Hispanic population, so learning Spanish is a very nice thing. And sometimes if there's a little bit of a language barrier, if you just gently tap 
well, you didn't have to say you're tapping. You just tap, um, especially patients that that can't hear also, you just tap in the location you want them to lightly, they will naturally look there. It works very well. And uh, if you have a patient you feel like you're just not communicating with or they don't want to hear you, just tap before you focus and they'll, they'll just naturally look in that location. So look down and to the left and then over to the left and I'll just kind of tap where I want them to lightly. You don't want to pound them obviously. Look up and to the left and then I have them at the very end look right at me. And at that right at me exam I get a good view of the nerve, the blood vessels, the macula again. And then that's the exam for the right eye. As I'm going, I will make a note of where I saw change. Well, I saw a little retinal defect or a retinal tear up at 10 o'clock. In my head, I think retinal tear off at 10 o'clock. As I'm going, I've learned I'll kind of repeat that in my head. Uh, okay, saw a tear at 10, and I am keep going to my exam. Remember, you have a tear at 10, and that way when I get down, I'm going to record my findings. I'll write them down. Um, but there's a lot of things to think about. So now I do the left eye. So same thing, I'll make sure their head is in the right position. I'll have them look straight up. And then I work temporal up and to the left, over to the left, down and to the left, straight down at your toes. Very good. Then for this, you could rotate to the other side of the body. It's easier. Or you could turn their head this way. Then look down and to the right, over to the right, up and to the right, very good. And so that's the posterior segment exam. The other thing that we'll commonly do is to do scleral depression, and that's where you use a little scleral depressor, you give them a numbing drop, and then you do that same peripheral exam with the scleral depressor around the side of the eye that allows you to see out to the aura serrata. So the posterior segment of the eye is like a fishbowl, where you have an opening in the top, and just like when you look down in the fishbowl, you can see everything that's straight back. Well, you can't see what's up underneath the rim of the fishbowl unless you stuck your head in there and looked up there. And so the scleral depressor allows you to press in underneath that lid of the fishbowl so you can see way out to the side of the eye. And that's commonly where disease processes occurs out by the aura serrata. Um, that's the indirect exam.